Awesome. So, All right, so I'm gonna get started. I'm Dr. Ann Sharkey. I'm a podiatrist. I graduated podiatry school in 2009 and finished residency in 2012. So I'm going on um, nine years out of residency training and I'm gonna chat with everyone today about a career in podiatry. All right, so let's start since this is kind of a broad scope and people interested in health sciences wanted to start with what is podiatry because to be completely fair and honest until I was about to graduate probably my junior year of undergraduate I didn't even know that podiatry existed as a separate field and podiatry or podiatric medicine is a branch of medicine devoted to study diagnosis medical and surgical treatment of anything related to the foot ankle and lower extremity and that can vary state to state in different areas. Um, some places will go all the way up to the knee and soft tissues. Others are more limited to the forefoot and rear foot. Um, but in general, it's a complete study of the foot, ankle, and lower extremity. Oh, I went backwards. Um, I am a doctor of podiatric medicine, which means instead of MD or DO, I have the credentials DPM. So I'm known as a podiatric physician or surgeon, and I'm qualified um, by training and education to diagnose and treat the conditions affected to the foot, ankle, and the related structures of the lower leg. A DPM or a podiatrist is a specialist. We talk about prevention, diagnosis, treatment of any of these disorders, diseases, and injuries of the lower extremity. We work independently. So as opposed to a nurse practitioner or a physician assistant, you work and hold your own license. Use um, x-rays, ultrasounds, MRIs, CT scans, lab tests for diagnostic purposes. We can prescribe medication, order physical therapy, reduce fractures, and perform surgery. So the spectrum of practice is very, very broad. Um, within podiatry itself, there's a lot of different avenues that one can go. So in a given day, my practice might encompass dermatology. Um, it might encompass radiology, caring for really elderly patients, caring for newborn babies with club foot, um, endocrinology with diabetics, peripheral vascular disease or vascular surgeons and sports medicine. So it's a really wide range of subspecialties and we can find even different fellowships or further certifications within podiatry in these specialties for those who are interested in doing just that in their practice. On an average day, in my, I would say like an average day in my life, you might be in clinic, you might be um, in hospital doing rounds or going to the emergency room to do consults or doing surgery. There's certainly charting and paperwork involved and phone calls and conversations with insurance companies, but um, an, an average day generally includes clinic and surgery or clinic and hospital or sometimes just clinic. And again, that talks about the wide range of patients that we treat in podiatry. Where can a podiatrist work? So this is actually really cool. You could be in private practice by yourself. You could be in private practice with a bunch of other podiatrists or just a single specialty group. You could be in a multi-specialty private practice group. Um, some of my friends and colleagues are in orthopedic groups. And so those are all kind of the private practice avenues. Some people are employed by large hospital systems. In fact, I spent the first five years after residency working in a large hospital organization. Um, some go into public health, maybe that's research, maybe that's policy making. A lot of that has to do with like diabetes and managing um, lower extremity amputation risk. The uh, armed forces, the VA or the Department of Veterans Affairs have a huge podiatry department. Certainly some people go into teaching, so they might work in the schools. Um, others are working for professional sports teams. That's not really super common, but it can happen. Um, ER is urgent care is and sometimes for municipal health departments. So you can really almost practice anywhere. How do you get to podiatry? So I decided, like I said, really kind of late in the game. I had already taken my MCAT and um, went to a um, career fair, I think it was for the health professions and walked around and was kind of looking at different medical schools and different options. And I was really interested in orthopedics, but I was a small female and I wasn't sure if I could manage doing these large hips and knee surgeries. 
Um, and in the background of my life, I've had had multiple knee surgeries during college. And so I wasn't sure I was going to be able to do a job where I would need to be standing a lot throughout my career. Um, I came upon this booth for podiatry school and I was really intrigued. I thought, well, what is this? And how is it different? Um, flash back or rewind to high school and I'd spent time in the training room. So I was really familiar with ankle sprains and those kind of injuries. And so I was really interested to find out that podiatry combined a lot of the things I loved. I loved the opportunity or the thought of being able to do surgery. And I really liked sports medicine and I liked working with athletes. Um, but I enjoyed other aspects of medicine, sometimes working with the older patients as well. And so I started to dive in and do some shadowing, which if you have the opportunity to shadow a podiatrist, and even now they have a lot of e-shadowing opportunities, it's a really fabulous way to get exposed to, to the career and you can get a feel of what it's like. And so in general, what you need is you need to complete an undergraduate degree and then um, complete your MCAT. You'll go into podiatry school, which is four years long. Two years are spent in the classroom full time. And then the last two years are really spent out on clerkships or rotations. And I think that varies by school, but in my circumstance, we changed rotation every single month. Um, following completion of podiatry school, you'll go into residency training, which I think is pretty much standardized three years across the board at this point in time. And then some people will go right from residency into practice. Others are going to go from residency into an additional year of fellowship. And then, of course, like all the medical specialties, following your training, there's this multiple ways of licensing and board certification. So every state requires a license to practice. And there's different boards that you can become certified in. You can be certified in the case of podiatry and podiatric medicine, um, in foot and ankle surgery. There's some sports medicine certification. So there's different certifications you can obtain depending on your practice afterwards. This is just kind of a fun slide. So it talks about, you know, why, why is podiatry separate from everything else? And it's really a complex anatomical structure. There's 26 bones, multiple ligaments, tendinous attachments. Um, and they're so instrumental in your everyday life. And if your feet hurt, everything is so affected. Uh, and I think it's underappreciated how important they are. And so it really is important that there's a specialty dedicated entirely to them. Why podiatry? So I touched a little bit upon why I chose it, but I really liked that it incorporated clinical and surgical medicine all into one. Um, you're allowed to follow a patient through a course of treatment. And so as opposed to someone who works in an ER or maybe an anesthesiologist where you meet a patient for a very small period of time in their life, this is a specialty where I see someone in the clinic and I'm presented with their initial problem. We're going to develop a relationship and a treatment plan, and you're going to see them through to the end of treatment. Occasionally, there's cases um, of more chronic management, like my diabetic patients, for those I'm just seeing continuously every three months or sometimes more frequently throughout the year. And so we're really able to develop a relationship with our patients. You can see pediatrics to geriatrics, you get that variety of age throughout the day. Um, and it does encompass the multiple subspecialties of medicine. So instead of having to pick one thing to do my entire life, like, oh, I'm only doing dermatology or I'm only doing endocrinology, I get to see and work with a little bit of that every single day. This is the fun part. So we're gonna chat case examples. So I spent some time kind of pulling um, from my recent cases. All of these have written approval from patients even though there's no patient identifiers on here, but they've all given them permission for photographs to be taken. This is an acute trauma. So I'll kind of give the back history on this. This is a patient that I was called on a Saturday evening from the emergency room. He had been trimming tree limbs in his yard. He was wearing shoes. Um, for some reason, the tree branch fell and bounced off the ground and basically crushed his foot on a ladder. So the ER had called and said, they have these injuries to the toes and the toenails. And you can see on the third toe, the nail is entirely flipped over. And on the fourth toe, it's barely hanging on. You can kind of see this picture here on the bottom. In all of these, those were open fractures. And so we took that into the um, operating room that night to wash it out and do some closure. And you can see this picture over here on the far right of the screen is um, what he looked like the first day after surgery. So that's kind of interesting. I mean, you come into this patient's life, they're in a lot of pain. They've gone through this big trauma. Um, you're gonna walk them through the initial procedure and he's been coming into the office every single week and we're watching this heal. So that's a really um, a great, 
feeling of honor to have these patients trust you in these times of need. The next is a very elective procedure. So bunions are quite common. They're hereditary and um, they affect more women than men, but we're gonna see this in clinic quite frequently. So maybe shoes are limited or activity is limited. And these are two very different types of bunion correction procedures. The images on the left-hand side of the screen are done with a newer technique, which is called minimally invasive surgery or MIS, minimal incision. Um, the surgery still involves large bone cuts and screw placement, but we're doing it just through a few stab incisions under a lot of x-ray guidance. And then on the right hand side, I don't have clinical photos, but we have x-rays here of before the deformity is corrected and after the deformity is corrected of the bunion deformity. So those are some of my favorite procedures. I love to walk patients through this and see the joy they have when they can wear shoes that they couldn't wear for a while, or they can do more activity that they had been limited to in the past because of this painful deformity that they had on their feet. Wound care. So diabetics, peripheral vascular disease, wound care is typically um, pretty involved in podiatry. Most of my podiatric friends do have some component of wound care in their practice if they're treating adults, usually not if you're treating pediatrics. Um, this particular patient we worked on for a long time. So on the left, you can see the big toe is present and it's dusky and kind of black and blue looking and there's a wound on the bottom of his foot and he had had a stroke that affected his walking and caused a lot of increased pressure underneath the ball of his foot where this open wound is. And he was diabetic and had neuropathy or lack of sensation. And coupled with that, because of the stroke, they, we learned that he had some clotting happening. And so he threw a blood clot that occluded the arteries going to the big toe, which resulted in that acute gangrene there. Um, because it affected a large portion of the foot, we had to do what's called a transmetatarsal tarsal amputation across the front of the foot. And you can see even in these pictures in the days right following surgery is that he was still having that purplish discoloration. And so the blood flow coming down to the foot was still not ideal. This is one where we involved multiple, multiple specialties. So wound care was involved and especially um, my vascular colleagues were involved to get some blood flow down to the area. So we had him seen in vascular and they did some angioplasties or angiograms to open blood vessels. And then we took him back to the operating room, cleaned up the tissue that was unhealthy and through multiple months of wound grafts and repeat surgery, eventually this last picture on the right-hand side, you can see that his wound was healed. So that was a very victorious moment. You develop a strong relationship with these patients. They're often coming into your office every single week. They're with their family members. You're, you're giving progress updates, taking photos, and it can take many months and sometimes up to a year. But the day that, that you get to say, hey, the wound is closed is a really, is a really fun day. This is another example of an elective surgery for deformity correction. And so this patient, she was so sweet. Um, you can see on the photo on the bottom, initially her second toe crossed over her big toe, which really limited her shoes and, and her activity. And she has lived with this for a long, long time and had been taping it and trying all kinds of different things. But eventually she was no longer able to do that. Um, so we were able to go in and kind of reconstruct the position of that toe to bring it down so she could better fit into shoes. Um, this is a soft tissue mass excision. So this was a ganglion cyst in particular. It was about the size of a small golf ball or so, and it sat on the top of this patient's foot. And so this was preventing him from wearing certain types of shoes. And more importantly, it was pressing on the nerves and tendons underneath of there, causing some numbness and tingling into his toes. Ganglions are filled with this gelatinous kind of fluid that are diagnostic for them. So usually the goal in surgery is to get the entire ganglion out without popping the cyst. Or, um, unfortunately, in this case, it was very, very large. And so we did have it pop during surgery, but I was able to get this great picture of the gel coming out of it. And then at the very end, we were able to excise the entire cyst from the top of the foot. I have some videos of ingrown toenail removal. So this is my most favorite procedure in the office. And I think this particular video goes on for a long time, but we kind of talk to the patient through removal of this ingrown toenail. Um, and then we're able to use a chemical called phenol underneath the skin at the nail root back here to make that nail not grow back again. Um, and it seems like something so simple and grown toenails, right? But patients come in and they're usually kids and they're in sports and it's 
stopping them in their tracks. It hurts so badly and they can get infected. And we're able to take care of that within 15 minutes in the office um, and get them back on their feet the next day. So um, I, my staff and I love ingrown toenails. We're very excited whenever we see them on the schedule. And that's my very quick presentation. I wanted to go quickly through the cases and through podiatry because I like more back and forth. So if anyone has any questions, then I think that'll bring up a lot of good discussion. Um, I have a question. Mm -hmm. So how do you deal with um, like a work-life balance, not getting burnt out, I guess? I guess, you know, going through medical school and having to take so many exams to become a podiatrist. Right, yeah. So. Um, it's tricky. And see, the, I think it's different for everybody. And so I had a really unique situation at the time. Um, he's my husband now, but he was my boyfriend. And we lived in two very different places. So we lived about three hours, four hours apart in different states. And so I had this motivation, if I wanted to see him on the weekends, that I needed to get all of my work done during the week. And so for me, that was... Um, that was kind of my driving force. I would spend my weeks in the library and studying and getting all of my work done. And then I was able to go on the weekends for the most part to, to see him or spend time with him. Um, I think that it also helped me if you're in a place we were, I lived around where friends of mine from undergraduate were, had moved. So I went to school at University of Wisconsin, moved to Chicago, had a lot of friends that kind of transitioned there. And so I had these friends outside of medicine. And I think having a little bit of life outside of medicine, no matter what that is, maybe you take photography classes, or maybe you join a, something, you have these small group of friends outside of medicine that pull you away from this like overwhelming sphere that you're in during medical school because otherwise it can be so engrossing and so all enveloping to be constantly surrounded by talk of what's the latest test and what's the lab score and how are you studying and what are you studying because you get caught up in this well am I doing as much as this person's doing syndrome and you're out you're comparing yourself always to others and that's such a common thing among the people in medical school so I think in that particular period in my life, that saved me a lot, just having those friends outside of medicine or interests outside of medicine. In residency, that's a tricky one. I mean, that one takes up a lot of your life. But for I, as I had a little bit more free time in my later years of residency, this is when I started getting interested in photography. And I bought a Groupon one day back when, I don't even know if Groupons are a thing anymore. And I went to um, a photography class and I started just walking around with my camera and taking pictures. And so what photography or whatever else, but it was like getting this outside interest where it had nothing to do with medicine that I could express the creative side and just use my brain in other ways. But I think finding a, an outlet where you don't have to think about your other job is important. Um, and then moving into life and practice and that becomes challenging in its own respect you think oh I finished residency I'm gonna have all this time but then you're driven by productivity and wanting to build your income and pay off your school loans and then you probably have a family and want to do all the things that you put off while you were in school um, and that that's so personal and for everyone their life balance looks different I mean if you work for a hospital system you might be spending more time in clinic or more time in surgery and for me, that looked like spending the first five years working for a hospital system and working like crazy um, and realizing that wasn't what I wanted to do all the time. And so I transitioned into private practice and I'm able to do half days in the office and I put in surgery where I can, but I'm home to pick up my daughter from school every day. And so finding what works for you based on where you live and what your job is, is kind of how that all it kind of works itself out in the end. Yeah. Okay, yeah, thank you so much for answering that. Um, and I was just wondering if you have any, like, I guess, advice in general for people who want to go into, you know, the field of dietary rather than, I guess, getting their MD or DO. Yeah, it can be, you, so like what, how advice for someone who might want to do an alternative route other than MD or DO. Yeah, it's interesting. There's I struggle sometimes and I think we all do in podiatry because you're sort of like the stepchild right and there's there's some people who don't even know that podiatrists are doctors or that we can do surgery um, and so doing things like this is really fun because we're spreading the word about it but the it can be in families I certainly have friends who their family members were not so excited that they chose podiatry they were hoping they would do MD or um, other other programs and 
there, I don't know, there's always a complex relationship between orthopedics and podiatry or in different hospital systems and different things. And sometimes it's like, well, there's more, my thought is there's more than enough feet to go around in the world. And there's always going to be someone who doesn't approve of the pathway that you choose. But ultimately, if you're finding joy and fulfillment in your career and you're helping people, which is why you likely went into medicine in the first place, then then you've completed your life's mission. And, and it all comes down to like making other people happy. And at some point you become more comfortable with saying, well, it's not really about you. It's about me. And there's, there's just, there's a lot of positive things to come out of this, this field. Okay, great. Thanks again. Um, if anyone else has any questions, they can use the chat feature um, or just unmute yourself. Yeah, I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, what has been your most interesting or unique case that, you, that you've had so far? Ooh. Okay, wow. Um, there's been a lot. I mean, I could pick in different specialties. So just a few months ago in clinic, we diagnosed a, it's called a Kaposi sarcoma. So it's a really interesting skin lesion or presentation of skin cancer that is typically found in individuals who are immunocompromised in some way. And this particular patient had had a liver transplant. So that was a very interesting clinic find. It's like a, a textbook thing. You don't see it very often. I've had varieties of patients come in with congenital defects. I have one individual, she's maybe in her late fifties and she has these crazy like multiple missing parts of digits. And that is from birth. She had this amniotic band syndrome where intrauterine, she lost blood supply to those. And so she was born missing parts of her fingers and parts of her toes and with club foot. Um, I mean, I could go on and on. There's just interesting congenital defects. I've seen really amazing deformity correction during residency. When I was in Chicago, we would do external fixators and take people who typically were, um, we were in Chicago, so it's a huge city and they would come from all over, but maybe they were from other countries and they came to the United States and they had terrible limb deformities and we would reconstruct them and use these external fixators to bring them walking without casts or braces for the first time in their life. Um, so, I mean, some of those, those are like the big examples. And then sometimes you can do really simple things like taking someone, for instance, the lady with the toe that crossed over and she couldn't do her bowling in her bowling shoes forever. And, and it seems so small to some of us, but it was so huge in her life. So those are, those are the big wins. Thank you for answering that. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, there's a question in the chat. I'm trying to see if I can see the chat. Let's see. Oh, there we go. Oh, what sparked my interest in healthcare? So I was forever interested in healthcare. I think I was born wanting to be in healthcare. There's pictures of me as a baby with a stethoscope. Um, my family, I grew up in a family where my parents had not gone to college. So it wasn't like I was born into medicine. It wasn't brought into me for some reason. I was always really interested in it. Um, and then I kept cultivating that interest. And so as early as I could, I volunteered at our local hospital and I would deliver food trays to patients. And that was my first, I think I was 14. And then when I turned 16, I wanted to get more involved. And so I went and got a certified nursing assistant license, which was a really fabulous way to see a lot of other specialties in the hospital. Um, you get to kind of meet and talk with some of the doctors that will come for rounds, see the patients undergoing different procedures, really get your hands in on some of the dirty aspects of medicine, but it gives you so much respect for nurses and those others that are working as part of the team. Um, and it was a great way for me to make some money during, during school. And so during undergraduate and my early years of pediatry school, I was able to kind of keep working at that a little bit. Um, so that was a really great plus as well. But so I was always innately interested in healthcare and I just cultivated it in other ways throughout the years. Um, how often are you seeing your patients versus doing like actual surgeries? Say that again, I missed the first part. Um, how often are you like seeing patients um, mm -hmm. just like performing surgeries? Oh yeah, sure. So I see patients in the office every single day. 
um, usually from about 8.30 a.m. until noon or so. And that, so that's just my particular schedule. So I see them in every morning and then I do anywhere between five and 10 surgeries a month. Um, also, um, do you have any like study techniques that you're willing to share that got you through, I guess, like medical school and that maybe you still use today? Did you say sayings? Oh, study techniques. Oh, study techniques. I was like, ooh. Um, <laughs> Oh, oh gosh. So for me, it was writing. Like I rewrote a lot of things. I would rewrite notes or retype notes. I had friends who were really big auditory listeners. So they would record the lectures um, and listen to them. I'm sure now a lot of things are recorded on Zoom, which is a little different. But um, so I, I was someone who had to like write it to commit it in memory or type it. And so I did a lot of that. Um, and I'm trying to think back to school. Lab was helpful for me. So for anatomy, I was a hands-on person. I often found myself in the anatomy lab. And so I think learning whether you're like an auditory learner or a tactile learner was helpful. I also remember so many concepts being so vague. And so for podiatry in specific, it's biomechanics. And you study a lot of biomechanics and what is the position of the foot and what is this range of motion? And it was really challenging in my second year of school because we didn't have any real example of that. We weren't in clinic, we didn't know how to see it. So you're just kind of memorizing these things in a textbook. And now as I exited out into practice and I would look at patients, I'd be like, oh, that, that's what they're talking about. That's, and so it just all of a sudden it makes so much more sense and it comes together more. And so I think if I were to go back for me, I would look for more picture examples or video examples or get more hands-on experience if that were even possible because that was just so important and I would imagine in many fields of physical exam like getting your hands on and actually doing it turns that light bulb on to what you're looking for. Okay great um so I don't think oh we have one more question. Yeah okay do you have any tips? So I think schools will look for very unique things when they're trying to get into more competitive programs. And I think people love volunteer experiences um, or to show that like you've kind of done your homework, that you've tried, you dove into the specialty a little bit and that you really love it. So some kind of passionate explanation other than just like, well, I went to class and I got good grades and I got to go to MCAT score. And those things are important. But as I've talked with more and more female females in medicine, particularly in some of these conferences that I'll go to, and they're in a wide range of specialties, the board scores are important or your MCAT scores are important, but getting some of those real life experiences weighs more often on the, on the admission committees than anything else. So I think if you can find a way to get involved in your community or to do some volunteer work that has to do something with healthcare, or if it's not healthcare, something you're really passionate about, but that is usually um, a unique interest and it shows that you kind of follow your passions and that you are eager to get involved with things. Okay, so I don't think anyone else has any other questions, but um, okay. thank you so much for coming. I really loved your presentation. Um, and okay. all, the advice that you do all right, thank you so much for having me. Yes, have a great day. You too.